This is a continuation of our lecture on the Endangered Species Act. We left off talking about what you should be doing about endangered species. And for some people, the question is, what should I do about an endangered species living on my property? Because believe it or not, half of our endangered species have about 80% of their home range on private property. So most of our endangered species are living on property that is owned by somebody other than the government. How then do we deal with that? One thing that we do is that people will create a habitat conservation plan or an HCP. This is developed in cooperation with a program uh, usually with a government program, and this will then allow you to then have a plan with them of how you will manage the habitat for the species in order to guard you against prosecution for doing something wrong. So you develop a habitat conservation plan, you make sure you have everything in order, and that's kind of the best way to handle it. Another thing is the no surprises policy. This means that it is not your fault if something happens to the endangered species on your property if you followed the habitat conservation plan. So let's say you are following your habitat conservation plan and suddenly the species that is on your property dies because of a flood or dies because of something else, maybe a virus that infected them. That then is not your fault because you follow the habitat conservation plan, thus protecting you from prosecution. Another thing that we have is the safe harbor agreement, which allows people to implement a species friendly measure in order to restore, to enhance, or to maintain their property. They're making it a safe harbor then for the endangered species that are found in the area. This may mean that you have access to some funds that would then help pay for the creation of the safe harbor areas. You can also create candidate conservation agreements with assurances. This provides incentives in order for homeowners or private property owners to protect species that are not yet listed under the Endangered Species Act. The goal with this is to help protect species that are likely of becoming endangered in order to keep them from becoming endangered. Because if we can keep something off the list, it is seen as a good use of our money. And our last thing that you can do if an endangered species is on your property is work through the private stewardship program. This makes grants and monetary assistance and sometimes physical assistance available to people. It is competitively awarded, so you have to put together some sort of a plan or a proposal. And it's given to both individuals and groups to help with species that are either on listed on the Endangered Species Act, that have been proposed for listing on the Endangered Species Act, or species that are candidates for it, or some other way that are at risk. This might mean that you all get together as a class and discover we have a species on campus that might be endangered and you put together a plan, submit it, and we could get money in order to protect it on campus. I'm not aware of an endangered species currently living on campus that we could do this for, but if you find one, maybe we could get money to protect it. When an agency is planning on doing some sort of an action, that could be in violation of the Endangered Species Act. They need to be able to consult with other agencies to ensure that they're not doing anything wrong. An action agency is some type of a federal agency, and they consult with a consulting agency, which is either the Fish and Wildlife Service, if it's dealing with land or freshwater things, or the National Marine Fisheries Service, if you're dealing with something that's in the marine environment. So they consult together prior to any action that could be a problem. The whole goal here is to ensure that you're not damaging or likely damaging a species or its habitat. And actions that are problematic are really those that would jeopardize the existence of the species or harm the critical habitat. So the concern is both the species existence and protecting the critical habitat. This consultation is required for actions that are funded by federal agencies and actions, surprisingly, include conservation actions, as well as regulations that could cause people to do things in areas where endangered species might be. It includes the granting of licenses, contracts, leases, easements, rights of way, permits, those types of things for the use of a property. 
that way we need to make sure that by using the property for a different method, we're not putting an endangered species at risk. These actions also include modification to air, water, and land in an area. In this consultation, the two groups will, or the multiple groups if necessary, will analyze if a listed species or habitat will be adversely impacted or if they will be potentially destroyed. If nothing's gonna happen, then they don't have to protect the species any better. And they can probably just proceed. If there's a chance that the habitat or the species will be impacted, they need to do a biological assessment to figure out what is actually required in order to protect the species. And if they realize that there's a definite yes that the species or habitat will be impacted, they have to do a formal consultation with a full biological opinion to be able to be sure that they can fully protect the endangered species. A biological opinion, which I just mentioned on the last slide, or a BO, includes a lot of different portions to it. The first is the summary. This is telling you what could happen, um, and it's giving a summarizing of everything that's a part of it. Its next step is including the discussion of the effects of, an, of um, your proposed action on the species or on the habitat because you wanna be sure that you know exactly what is going to happen. They will then provide an opinion on whether or not the action puts the species themselves at risk, or if it is a risk of modification to the habitat. And if there is risk, then you wanna be sure that you are providing reasonable and prudent alternatives, or you wanna make the case that there aren't any alternatives and this is the best reasonable and prudent alternative because the goal is to protect the endangered species and their critical habitat. If you can't do that, then we have a problem. You must also include an incidental take statement or an ITS. This is when you might kill something accidentally or without purpose in connection with otherwise lawful activities. So you were driving your truck down the road, that's a road you're allowed to drive it down, and suddenly you hit and killed an endangered species. That type of stuff needs to be potentially included in this. And an incidental take statement, remember, is basically a permit to take or to harm, to maim, to kill a species that is listed. And um, it's a permit to do this, yes, but it doesn't mean that you will do it. And while some people have argued that these incidental take statements are in fact a permit to kill an endangered species, what they are is a permit to do so if it is unfortunately done in cooperation with your lawful activities. Sometimes a biological opinion will say that the action agency wants to have more consultation with uh, the cooperating agencies like Fish and Wildlife and Marine, National Marine Fishery Service, so that they make sure that they are following directions and doing everything correctly. If an action agency is wrong in preparing this though, and there is a problem when they said there wouldn't be, they are subject to enforcement from the federal government. This is also done when incidental takes are exceeded. So if you're allowed to kill three bald eagles and you kill 15, you're in a lot of trouble. Um, it's also problematic if you eventually find new information saying that your action is actually threatening the species or their habitat or if somehow your action modifies the habitat in a way that you did not, in, that you did not um, plan for in your plan. Or if a new species that is found in your area is listed, you then need to consider that again. So there's a chance that the biological opinion by the time it's written by, and then eventually gets approved, things could change and either require revision, or if you don't change them, may later require enforcement. And one of the agencies involved in this is sometimes seen as the God Squad or the God Committee. There are seven people involved. It includes the Secretaries of Agriculture, Interior, and the Army, the Chair of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, EPA Administrator, NOAA Administrator, and some representative of the state that is appointed by the President, usually the state that is in question, sometimes multiple states. This committee will grant an agency an exemption from the Endangered Species Act if there are no reasonable and prudent alternatives, or if the benefits of the public interest greatly, greatly, greatly outweigh the benefits of alternative actions that would have allowed you to conserve a species, 
So somehow saying this option is the best for the public because. And if there's a regional or national importance for the action. The Bureau of Land Management and Timber Sales and the Northern Spotted Owl, you will see this a little bit in our um, our reading that you respect, that you will be discussing on uh, Brightspace today. And so far, the good news is the God Squad has never allowed a species to be wiped out by a federal agency. And that is perhaps the goal, that sometimes we might allow a federal agency to make a decision that will hurt an endangered species, but never should we allow it to wipe out a species. Homeland security does sometimes have the ability to use national security as a way to trump the Endangered Species Act. I'm not sure entirely what I think about that. Um, because, well, I'm not certain that national security issues that harm endangered species are a good thing. But then again, if there is a threat to our national security and an endangered species is between us and somebody who's gonna hurt a whole lot of people, we do need to be concerned about that. The God Squad is capable of giving exemptions based on recommendations from the Secretary of Defense, and this is where Homeland Security and National Security comes in. National security is one of these ways that exemptions can be given, and sometimes it has been given for roads, fences, and other projects. Whether or not it can be um, applicable to a wall between the United States and Mexico, we'll have to see because there is a great concern for endangered species that you cross between Mexico and the United States and what a wall would mean for their critical habitats. And for a moment, we're going back to the concept of incidental takes um, and dealing with habitat conservation plans. The relationship between incidental takes and habitat conservation plans is focused on reducing the conflict between protecting species and the economics of development. Because if you're protecting a species, but it means that doing a project is gonna cost 10 times as much, that can be a problem. You're trying to create a creative partnership between the public, so um, the government, and private actors, the people that are developers or that are doing residential work. Habitat conservation plans um, will specify impacts that are likely to happen that can um, cause problems for the endangered species, actions that are likely then to reduce those impacts. They're gonna try and figure out what type of funding is available to reduce the impacts, and why have you not taken alternative types of actions? And what types of things might fall under this? Well, logging, which could affect things by knocking down trees where animals might live wind power construction, which could kill birds flying into windmills, and construction of dams, which hurts um, animals that are swimming. Low impact actions are usually expedited, so they're quickly passed through. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fishery Service may make recommendations to avoid or minimize impacts that could make a permit unnecessary. And we must make sure that any of these actions will not reduce the likelihood that a species will recover. The CDS policy is important to know about. It's the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Flora and Fauna. It is a cooperative agreement uh, by 40 nations, and depending upon the type of the way a species is listed, there's a sliding scale of, um, of protection. So if something is threatened versus endangered, critically endangered, those things, what happens will be different. Under um, cities, it is unlawful to trade, import, or possess fish, wildlife, or plants that are listed here. But, and this is a really, really, really big but, this only applies if they're alive. So if you happen to have a dead white rhino in your house, eh, this has nothing to do with it. If you happen to have a live one in your house, we have a totally different story. And in the United States, violations of cities are a misdemeanor act. Uh, the last major thing to mention is just the freedom of religious exemptions. This is part of the Endangered Species Act. It does provide some freedom for religious groups, specifically dealing with Native Americans and Alaskan Natives, um, like the Alouette, the Eskimo, and the um, Alaskan Native Indians. 
And in it, this deals with the fact that tribes are given um, ability to rule over their own tribal lands and in U.S. laws have to work cooperatively with them. The freedom of religious exemption exists as a subsistence purpose. It includes the selling of any edible portion of fish or wildlife in native villages and towns in Alaska, other places for consumption, um, and also the creation of authentic Native American articles of handcrafts and clothing, where um, they've used the endangered species in some way as part of the natural materials. And this is only if those handicrafts are created and sold by the people that this applies to. Um, and this includes things like weaving, carving, stitching, sewing, lacing, beading, drawing, and painting. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there are some things that they cannot do under this, but they can incidentally take or purposefully take an endangered species as part of this. Um, the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act did take away the right of Native Americans to take eagles. Having said that, even when they had the ability to do so, they generally did not choose to utilize that action. I am asking you to follow up on this idea on the discussion board with um, just a couple questions about this, because I think it's a really interesting thing to think about that we have a federal action that is giving religious exemptions. It would not be the type of action we expect a religious exemption for. And since many religions, including Native American religions, place such a high level of importance on endangered species, well, at least of caring for creation, it's kind of a very interesting thing that we're allowing them here. And then uh, with this, you should watch one of these videos. The one that worked best for me was the YouTube link in the middle. Um, they're all the same about the dune sage breast lizard. The video is from May 31st, 2011, and there's some questions that you're gonna answer as a follow-up on Brightspace to this. And we're gonna talk next time about what the Fish and Wildlife Group decided to do about the dune sage breast lizard. Thanks so much, and check out the rest of the, the assignment on Brightspace.